Welcome to the favorites, the podcast from the Volume Podcast Network. I am Shad Millman, Chief Content Officer of the Action Network. It's the Tuesday before March Madness begins. It's the most wonderful time of the year. I am joined, as I am for every episode, by my co-host, my BFF, my companion, my compadre, professional better, Simon Hunter. Aloha, Simon. Aloha, Chad. What a weekend we had, brother. Duke won the ACC tournament. UNC isn't in March Madness. And the Bears traded the number one pick, Chad. What a weekend we had. Listen, we're going to get to March Madness uh, because I am so stoked about it. And our guest today is Action Network OG, the first person I had dinner with. When I joined Action Network, which wasn't even Action Network yet, we're talking September of 2017. I leave ESPN on a Friday. That Monday, I'm in the city. Tuesday night, I go to dinner with the one named wonder, Stucky, host of our BBOC podcast covering college football and college basketball host of our BBOC live show. The guy has gone from, you know, financier to full-time media professional who can handle it all. He was also host to me and you, Simon, and Matt Mitchell. When we had a great weekend in Lexington in the fall for the Breeders' Cup, we're going to bring him on in one second. Um, we're going to talk all things March Madness because he's brilliant at it. Uh, named himself after his favorite college basketball player. That's how much he loves and knows college basketball. These fucking bears, man. These fucking <laughs> bears. They yeah. signed TJ Edwards from the Philadelphia Eagles, their leading tackler. They signed Tremaine Edmonds from the Buffalo Bills. And me, you, and Mitchell have been talking about that the last couple of days, and you've kind of both been bringing me down about the signing. <laughs> they've, they've traded the number one pick put ourselves in a position to get what we need in DJ Moore. I contend that Josh Allen did not become Josh Allen until he had Stefan Diggs. Justin Fields cannot be Justin Fields to his full potential until he has someone like DJ Moore. We're building something special. No, we love it. And it's as, as people are giving me shit, they're like, Oh, you're just making a pick on the bears just because you do this show with Chad. I don't care who Chad likes that. That's irrelevant to me betting a Super Bowl future. So Feeling pretty good if you got the Bears at 100 to 1 or 80 to 1. Now they're down to 50 to 1. This is a scenario we dreamed of. They have the weapons, they're slowly adding the weapons to the defensive side and the offensive side of the ball. And if they keep adding guys at offensive line, again, I think you guys still have about 40 million left to spend or maybe 45 million left. Um, to me, there's still room to improve for this Bears team. And we're still just waiting, just like everyone else. If it Rodgers leaves that division, Chad. I can easily see the Bears going from plus 300 to maybe plus 250, plus 200 to win that division. So it's really exciting if you're a Bears fan or a Bears backer just because they made the moves we're hoping for. So, yeah, it's never a dull moment with the NFL, Chad. I love it. I love it. There's been so much exciting stuff going on, and we're going to get to all of it. Uh, before we bring in Stucky, who, as I mentioned, hosts the Big Bets on Campus podcast. Go check it out. To me, the Big Bets on Campus podcast – no disrespect to any podcasts, including ours. I think it's probably the best representative of the confluence of what I love about action. It's personality. It's connected to the audience. It's research-based. It's professional betting feel. It's glorious. I freaking love it. At last, we bring in the OG, Stucky. Hey, what's going on, guys? Yeah, Chad, it's amazing how far we've come as a company. When we when I first was brought on, uh, we were sports action. The web website is sportsaction.io. <laughs> and Mead reached out to me and was like, We need, we're, you know, we have this app and we're we want to start a company. We need someone to do content. Originally, for the first three months back in what, 2017? 2017. I was the only. I was the entire content team. I was the I was the writer and the editor editing the editing team. So I would write. So I think like Daniel Scotty who now does other stuff for us. And then I got Colin eventually to just write a couple articles. But I was writing like NFL, college basketball, tennis, and then I would edit it myself, and then put it out on this like janky uh, 
sportsaction.io website and uh look how far we've come now it's pretty wild. those were the freaking days um it was so early that you had a private twitter account and i had to ask you to uh approve me so i could follow you <laughs> yeah yeah i mean That's... i was working in in corporate america and finance for a huge company that was pretty conservative and like i couldn't have them know what i was spending most of my time doing and it was funny that that at the that fall my boss you know and i was kind of plateaued i was a senior analyst and i was fine with where i was i was spending most of my time vetting and i didn't want to manage people or anything so but i was spending so much time trying to put out content we had a pot i could start a podcast um that my my work was slacking i had i had plans to leave on the first of the year but my boss who's like some kid out of like an mba rotational program uh he now i was still getting everything i had done but i just wasn't showing up to any meetings or anything it wouldn't show up any, any day i would just go in the middle of the night and do everything i had to do and he pulls me into his office. He's like, we have to have a talk. Can you come in and meet? And I was like, I know what he's, so I, I just stopped him before he started. It's like, I'm going to leave now. And then he's like, I'm, I'm, I was like, I'm leaving now. So I figured like, to take two weeks. I was like the only one who knew how to price some of the derivatives we were doing, but no, they had company policies. Like you leave them like, cause you could take, they don't know if you're going to a competitor. So I got like walked out. Um, and I was like, oh my God, I'm really doing this. Um, so yeah, I left, left my entire career, had my master's in finance CFA and, you know, sometimes you got to take big risks. And that was my ultimate gamble. And fortunately, it uh, paid off. And here we are today. Worked out for all <laughs> of us. And now we get to talk about betting and March Madness. Um, you, uh, Mike Calabrese, who's going to be on the show on Thursday, Anthony DeBundo, Maria Marino, had an amazing show on Sunday night after the brackets were revealed, road to the final score. Everyone can go check it out on YouTube. I felt fully prepped after w watching that show about who was underseated. Nick Giffen was on that show too. Um, who the Cinderella's are. I unloaded about 10 to 15 bets after that show. So before we get to it, let's just talk about Thursday for a second, because people are going to be listening to this show over the next 48 hours. As you look at the Thursday matchups, we're going to talk about Cinderella's. We're going to talk about Final Four. We're going to talk about Dark Horses and all that. But Thursday's games. So we're looking at uh, uh, the bracket starts with West Virginia, Maryland at 12-15 on Thursday. The last game of the day is uh, UCLA, UNC Asheville. Who are your picks for that day? Who are your best bets for Thursday? I don't want to make people wait. Yeah, well, starting off, the first game is at 12-15 Eastern yep. on CBS between West Virginia and Maryland. Fun regional matchup. I I did play some under first half, under 65. If you go back in the past over the past 25 years, first half unders of 70 or lower have hit at 66% for these noon tips and in, in the NCAA tournament. And it makes some sense. Like there's some jitters, especially for like this first game. And I think that that's the case for a lot of the games on the first two days is these teams come out and you're nervous. There's a lot of nervous energy. Uh, you kind of feel each other out and there's new rims. So, and Maryland plays really slow. I like the matchup for both defenses. Maryland doesn't really turn it over which is where West Virginia really thrives and they can compete on the glass against West Virginia. So I like both matchups for the defenses. And I think that each team will come out a little jittery and this will play a little slower. So uh, historically that's been a very good bet. 1240. I do like Furman against Virginia. It gives me similar vibes to Ohio as in another 13, four matchup two years ago, who I loved against Virginia it's probably my favorite bet over the past couple of years in the tournament. And they ended up winning outright. That game Virginia's... is at five and a half, by the way. Furman is plus five and a half. Do you, when you yeah. say you like Furman, are you saying you like Furman outright? Yeah. I mean, in my bracket, I'll probably pick them. I think it'll, it's a game that'll come down to the wire. Furman has a, an excellent offense. They play, you know, they led by two fifth year seniors in Mikey Bothwell and Jalen Slauson. And they have, they play a five out offense. So they, they're playing, at all times, pretty much with five guys who can shoot 
And, you know, they're not going to try and go into the post, which is good against Virginia. Virginia plays a pack line defense. You need to shoot over the top of them. And I'm just really down on the ACC in general. And Virginia recently lost one of its shooters in Ben Vanderplas, who I think they miss offensively. Their ceiling is just really limited and they play really, really slow. So it's hard for them to blow out teams. There's just going to be a limited number of possessions in this game, which favors the underdog. And that's kind of a theme, you know, and, and Furman takes a, a ton of threes. They can make them. They're experienced. And this game will have a limited number of possessions. And that's kind of the formula with, uh, you know, a, a good formula to look for if you're trying to pick either underdogs in your bracket or upsets, I should say, or betting some underdogs of these, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 seeds is you want to increase the variance of the game, especially if you're looking to pull an outright upset. So slower paced games, teams that don't turn it over and that can shoot, that shoot a lot of threes and can make a lot of threes, right? That's going to increase the variance. You have fewer possessions and then, you know, teams that can make a lot of threes and don't turn the ball over that are just going to give away possessions and let, you know, most likely superior athletic teams get out in transition and get easy buckets and put big runs on them. That's the case here with Furman. Yeah, who can definitely shoot. Now there's good there's gonna be three point variants. If they're missing all the threes, they'll, you know, they're gonna lose and they probably wouldn't cover. But I think they're, they're gonna be very comfortable in this matchup. I like them. Well, An interesting on. game. Me, uh, yeah, sure. Hold on. Um, because I do feel like these first five, six games on the board, from what I saw of your show, you guys all had almost consensus like your cinderella parts were Furman, utah state which wasn't really a cinderella but compared to the sec which is missouri's coming out of that you loved utah state simon every time i i say a name you oral roberts against duke louisiana against tennessee simon every time i say a name you're shaking your head well, I was agreeing with some of the things you were saying, not so much to Or Robinson. Uh, or but I was going to ask about this. <laughs> Just if we've seen now basketball, college basketball has changed so much over these last couple of years. I mean, especially the last 10 years where you're looking at these 12 and five seeds, these 13 and four seeds. I mean, these spreads are only five and a half stuck. Six. Is it, are we better off? I know Evan put out the stat about if you just take the money line of these five, I mean, of these 13 and 12 seeds, you're better off than just taking the spread. Like it's more profitable over time. Are you looking at the same thing this year where, because these aren't spreads of eight or nine anymore, they're down to five, five and a half. Are we better off? Like say I want to fade San Diego State University. Should I just take Charleston and just take the money line? Or or, or are you still taking spread in a lot of these games? Yeah, I'm still taking the spread, but it's always, I think, prudent to just sprinkle a little bit on the money line as well. Uh, over the past 10 years, 11 seeds actually have a winning record overall against six seeds. I think they went three and one last year. Wow. But yeah. You, you mentioned some of these shorter spreads. It's, uh, you know, I'll bet the tournament until the day I die. It's like a betting bonanza. It's, this is the first, college best was the first sport I fell in love. It's the first sport I started betting in high school back in, you know, the early two thousands, I built a following on like the f betting forms. All I was betting was college basketball. Um, and I can think back to like 2007, 2008, and then even, you know, eight to 10 years ago, the especially the opening lines but in general the market was so inefficient and these openers on sunday night after the bracket came out they would move so much you would have these underdogs that open way too high and then they would just get pummeled and they would still probably open a little too high now and markets are getting more efficient with each passing day you have you know a lot of analytical sites out there the the just betting market in general is more intelligent so the market is just so much more efficient. You see these underdogs open a lot shorter than they used to. And you don't see as much movement in the market from the opening spreads to, you know, throughout the week up until tip. And that's because the market is much more efficient and much more keen to some of these potential underdogs from mid-major conferences. So yeah, it's it, it's a, a wise observation on how much more efficient the market has gotten. And it's definitely not as easy to beat as it used to be. Well, now, do you a, see it? I'm go, sorry, John. Do you, you, go, do you see like a George Mason type or a Butler type that could be some underdog that makes some crazy run about, you know, some team that has 
four seniors that no one's talking about that are uh, 11 seed or a 10 seed that can make a run. That's, that's my favorite thing of college basketball. You get these guys who they stay together for all these years and eventually it clicks. I mean, that Wichita state run, I remember they had all these crazy good seniors and they made it to a final four. Are, are there any teams that pop out to you like that run into this year stuck? Yeah. I mean, you just saw a team in Penn state make a run. They're a 10 seed, you know, they're, they just made a run as a 10 seed in the big 10 tournament, oddly enough. They are the most experienced, as far as just D1 experience, most experienced team in the country. They can shoot. They attempt threes at a top 10 rate. They make threes at a top 10 rate. They don't turn it over. They don't foul. And it's just a super experienced team with a great guard in Jalen Pickett. And they're kind of peaking at the right time. They have also have an excellent coach, one of the best schemers in all of college basketball. That's really important, something I value, especially on these quick turnarounds. So the second days of the weekend, so your second round, and then in the Elite Eight, by the way, we'll be in Hoboken and Mad Hatter for our watch party. So make sure you check that out at actionnetwork.com and RSVP if you haven't. But that's that's really important. That's where coaching can really have an edge is when you have those quick turnarounds. You have to prep for a team that you're not familiar with on a day or two. So Penn State, I think they match up well with Texas A&M. Because, look, Texas A&M thrived during SEC play. They give up a ton of threes, one of the highest three-point attempt rates allowed in the country. They, under, they go under screens. They're really aggressive. That works in the SEC. Nobody can shoot in the SEC. It was the worst three-point shooting conference in the country. And there's some bad conferences out there. But now they're going to go up against a team that can really shoot. Texas A&M also thrives in the offensive glass, getting to the line and turning teams over. Penn State doesn't foul, is great on the defensive glass, and they don't turn it over. So it's a team with good guards and shooting and a great coach and is very experienced. They're a team that Look, they get by Texas A&M. It's going to be a tough game, but I like the matchup. Face Texas in the second round. It's certainly a winnable game if those threes are falling. So that's a team that, uh, you know, it's a power conference team, but it's a 10 seed that I think can make a run. As far as a shocker shock, I mean, look, two years ago, we had a 15 seed in Oral Roberts make the Sweet 16. It was only the second, sweet, second 15 seed ever to make the Sweet 16. Last year, St. Peter's trumped them became the third team to make the Sweet 16 and the first 15 seed to make the Elite Eight. Can I predict a 50? You know, if you could predict that, I, <laughs> you should be right. playing Powerball. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't see it, but whoever does, you never really see it with a 15 seed. I mean, maybe a team like Vermont. Vermont profiles, you know, the, in the East Regional, there's a lot of teams that are, that I think are overseeded. And there's a lot of teams in the West that are underseeded. I mean, in the West, there's, the top five teams are all in the top 11 on Ken Palm. That's crazy. And then you have TCU's number six dealt with injuries all year at full strength. They're arguably a top 10 team. So you can make a case. You have six top 15 teams in the West, which is crazy. And then in the East, you know, Purdue's a vulnerable one. Tennessee is a vulnerable four. They lost one of their best guards for the season. You know, you have a three seed in Kansas state who I have is like power rated as like number 28 in the country. So they should be like a six seed. You know, and then Marquette, they made it a run last weekend. Very good team, but they probably would have been a three if they didn't win the Big East last week. So it's a lot of overseeded teams. Vermont profiles as a underdog that can pull off an upset because they play slow. They have tons of ball handlers and shooters, so they don't turn it over, and they're very well coached. So that's a very dangerous team if the threes are falling. And Shaka Smart, you know, taking it back to the NFL, reminds me a lot of Mike Tomlin. He is a uber motivator so you know his team's in the underdog role only tim floyd over the past 30 years is better against the spread than shaka smart as an underdog he is unbelievable when his teams are in the underdog role it's us against the world they come out and they just thrive and they play with so much more energy and that's you know they kind of play above their talent level but when they're a favorite they don't really bring in as much and over the past 30 years shaka smart's the fourth least profitable coach as a double digit favorite he's 40 and 63 against the spread that's a, among 850 coaches. So they Marquette has struggled in this role before. I don't know if Vermont has enough talent to get it done, but they can shoot. They don't turn it over. They're not going to beat themselves and they're well coached. So if I had to pick one, I would go with Vermont. A lot of people are going to say Colgate, but Colgate plays no defense. They're going to be at such an athletic disadvantage against a team like Texas. Um, so yeah, but those, if you can predict the 15 seed, that's going to make a run. You're probably going to win your bracket. Ra ra, Shaka. Yeah. They call him <laughs> Ra Ra Shaka. Uh, we didn't finish 
your favorite bets for Thursday. Simon immediately jumped into Cinderella's. And I know we wanted to talk about, it's not a, like I said, it's not an, it's not a uh, Cinderella, but Utah State, Missouri. That was one that immediately came up on Sunday night. Uh, the line has bounced around. Utah State was at two and a half. Now it's down to one and a half. So it's moved in Missouri's direction. Do you like Missouri Utah was actually State? a one point favorite at one point. Um, so yeah, that line is moving all over. The, it's a very, it's a game that is the prototypical analytics versus athletes game. So Utah State profiles very well analytically. They're like a top 20 team. Missouri does not. Analytics hate this Missouri team, but they have really good athletes and they're going to have a big athletic advantage against Utah State. And the other thing working in Missouri's favor is the Mountain West has been absolutely horrifying in the term. They haven't won a game since 2018. I think they're 0-9 against the spread in their past nine tournament games and over their past 50, I think they're 14, 35, and 1. So it has not been smart to back the Mountain West. I'm going to go against the grain here, and I did play Utah State. I like the matchup for them. These are two teams that are super three-point reliant. There's going to be a ton of threes in this game, a ton of points. But Utah State does a better job of defending the three. And again, like I said, Missouri gives up a ton of threes. And like I said before, the SEC, that's okay because no one can shoot in the SEC. Utah State, one of the best three-point shooting teams in the country. Missouri also will throw out a bunch of zone. They'll press you a bunch, so they mix up their defense. But Utah State grades out elite against the zone and against the press. So I like them here. But keep in mind, the total is 155. I would look at the over two. I think both teams are going to score at will. Keep keep this in mind when you're betting the tournament. These games with higher totals, with you know implied offense all over the place, you can live bet too. So you don't have to bet uh, ahead of time. And you know I think there's going to be a lot of swings in this game. So, you know, I bet Utah State, and I'm going to look to bet Utah State some more. If Missouri goes on a run, I expect this to game to be back and forth. But I have a ton of respect for both coaches. But I just think the Utah State offense will get better looks from three, and they can make them. But they'll be at an athletic disadvantage, so it's definitely an intriguing matchup. All right, I want you to, because there's other stuff I want to get to, um, just give me a – Name of your favorite bets. I don't need an explanation. Just the name of your favorite bet for Thursday that we haven't discussed so far. We've gotten West Virginia conversation, Furman, UVA, Utah State, Missouri. Of the remaining games, what are your favorite bets? Because I do have to ask you about a specific game. So just give me the team of your favorite bet. Uh, Oral Roberts is the uh, is the one that we didn't mention. I would look to see if you can get a seven. Um it's down to six and a half now. You might get some late Duke money, but yeah, I make that game three and a half. And I Duke has improved significantly, a lot of talent, but I think a lot of it's smoke and mirrors. They run through the ACC, which is so down. You know, you play a Miami team who lost one of their best players on the first minute, a Virginia team that lost one of their key players recently. So yeah, Duke after winning the conference tournament, everyone saw this run. It's Duke. I think they're a little overvalued here. And Will Roberts is great. I mean, they've won 17 in a row and they have Max A. Smith, one of the best guards in the country. They've done done this before. Their defense is even better than that team that made a run. Oral Roberts is scary. If Duke wins that game, they can make a deep, deep run. And they're the rightful favorite. But Oral Roberts can put a scare in them if Ace is going off and Duke struggles defending the pick and roll. And that's what Oral Roberts is going to do all game. That is one of the games I'm looking forward to the most of the entire first round. Well, that's the game. Simon, I want you to ask about Duke because I know how much you love the Dukies. Yeah, I love... I mean, it's it's lazy capping. I will admit to that, but it's the rule of thumb I live by, which is you bet a team that wears blue to win the national championship. It sounds lame, but it's been good to me. And last year I had Kansas. That hit for me. I think I gave them out 11 to 1 or 10 to 1. This year it feels like Duke's that team of, like you just talked about, if they can get through this first round, it seems set up really nice for them. And, you know, they're in a conference where, like you talked about, there's some conferences that are overloaded with weird seating where Duke doesn't really have that. I kind of I can see their clear path to that Final Four. My only hesitation is, I don't want to put it on him, but it's the head coach, right? Coach K had been there so many times before. Um, that is such a huge deal. I mean, even we can say what we want about Syracuse, 
when they were in the tournament, they were just different, right? Because it felt like because the coach had been there before and everything gets a little tighter in the tournament. Do you think it's going to play out bad for Duke because of the head coach stuck? Or do you think that doesn't matter for them, that it really is about the players? But am I ever thinking this too much that I'm a little worried about the head coach? Even though I, I'm with Chad, I bet Duke to win it all. My only hesitation is the head coach. Yeah, I mean, there's the head coach matters, like I said, on, on those quick turnarounds, especially when you have to prep quick. But I, I've been pretty impressed with Shire. Duke does have some maybe similar vibes to North Carolina last year. Struggled a bit during the season, you know, turned it on late with a first year head coach, talented team. And they get in and, um, you know, and they knocked off Carolina a few times, just like Carolina knocked them off. And they get in and they make a deep run. And, and you're right that they, they're in that East regional as the five seed. And I think that the, you know, there, there's a bunch of teams that are overseeded in that region. I, I'm hoping just from a selfish perspective here in Lexington, we get a Duke and Duke, Kentucky elite eight <laughs> matchup, which would be awesome. Uh, so yeah, that'd be amazing. Cool. But yeah, I mean, sir, there's a quick plug on a couple of things all about. I have, I have a piece that's out that'll be out today ranking the, the chances of the 13 through 15 seeds and their best, the best chance of pulling off an upset. And it's not just spread based. But that would be easy to do. You just look at the spreads. It's more which games have the highest variance. And like, so like, which games are going to be slow? Are there going to be a lot of threes? Like, which of the teams profile as an underdog that could pull off a stunner? And then, so make sure you check that out. I think a lot of the teams on Friday, and then you know, you guys are going to have another episode with Mike Calabrese. Some of the, you know, UCSB, Montana State, Vermont, those are the teams that profile as, you know, your 13, 14, 15 seeds that could potentially pull off an upset. But you mentioned, yeah, the the coaching with Syracuse. A lot of why they were always so successful in a tournament format is they they played a zone defense, and not a lot of teams play a zone or see a zone, and they get out of conference, and you're playing a, t- a team in a scheme that's unfamiliar to you, and you don't have that much time to prepare for it. You don't even know your opponent a lot of times, you know, especially on the that second day of the weekend. And I'll have another piece out going through who are the zone teams, the press teams, and looking for those uh, outliers of different unique styles and schemes, but yeah, I mean, the experience of Shire on those quick turnarounds, it could prove to be Duke's fatal flaw, but I've been pretty impressed with what he's done this year. And I think that he was doing a lot towards the end of coach K's tenure. Um, you don't have that steadying force there, but Duke, if they can get by or Roberts, I think it's going to be a really good game. Yeah. They certainly can make a run. They're in the right bracket to do so. The East is is wide open. A lot of overseeded teams as opposed to, the West where everybody is under seated. Breaking news. Um, the bears have re-signed long snapper, Patrick scales. Surprise. Those the odds. Bears aren't. podcast. I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised. Those odds aren't already dropping by the way, stuck. I'm surprised you guys show, didn't sign another linebacker. They, uh, <laughs> they, listen, the monsters are back. That's all I got to say. Yeah. Um, Earlier in the show, you started talking about our uh, March Madness watch party, which anyone can go to for free. It's at Mad Hatter in Hoboken, New Jersey on March 25th at 6 p.m. I'm going to be there. You're going to be there. Raybon's going to be there. Maria Marino's going to be there. Matt Mitchell's going to be there. Uh, oh, Mitchell's going to be there? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Three quarters, 75% of the Wolf Pack. That's this group right here. <laughs> going to be there. Uh and so I'm super excited about that. Uh, if I were you, you want we want you to RSVP. Just go type in Action Network and Mad with two Ds Hatter M A D D Hatter into Google, and you're going to get the link to go RSVP. Go RSVP, hang out with us. There's a ton of sports that night. True story. Three years ago, this week basically, we had uh, a deposit at Mad Hatter for a watch party. For March Madness, obviously, we're delayed three years, but we're glad to be going back there to do it. Um, yeah, I've been there before. It's a really good spot for to watch the, the tournament. It's a stuck. Really Last time you and I setup. watched a big event in New Jersey it was the Super Bowl when yep. uh, Patrick Niners Mahomes, Chiefs. yeah, Patrick Patrick Mahomes dropped back eighteen times to lose twenty seven yards and go under his rushing total. Thank God for all of us. All right, we've talked about some picks. We've uh, talked about Duke specifically. We've given a little bit of conversation around Dark Horse in Vermont. Here's what I want to know. Tell me about your final four. 
Well, we will have a. I, mean, I feel like this is a show of plugs, but we have such so much content coming up. We'll, we'll have a bracket reveal show, right? Are we going to reveal our brackets? Tom, uh, I think tomorrow. Um, I think tomorrow, me, you, Raybon, and Maria Marino have a little bit of a bracket reveal show. But I'm okay with you telling people right now. Yeah. So yeah, but I'm. I'm just, all I'm going to say is on that show. Make sure you. Uh, we'll tweet it out and stuff. Will be my final, final, final four. <laughs> um, so like I'm still working through the games, and so this is subject to change, but I'll, I'll be locking in my final four. Then, I only enter like big pools, and it's important to keep in mind, by the way, like if you enter like a really big pool, you want to take some shots and you want to be risky, and then take a look at like, you know, we'll we'll have percentages on brackets and you can find them out there and you know every if everyone has this one team winning it or going to the final four like don't pick them if you want to win a big pool um you're gonna have to stand out so i i do take a little riskier route so we'll start in the in the west which is loaded and i think it's a good bracket to take a chance on with you know arguably six top 15 teams because there could just be carnage all over and even kansas arkansas has three potential first round draft picks illinois is super talented they could lose. I could. I think they're them and Purdue are very vulnerable in the, in the second round. They're the ones he's that could go down in the second round. So that's wide open. And my preseason, my only preseason future was TCU. I, I'm gonna. I love the matchup for TCU against Gonzaga because TCU was great when they run. And then UCLA is dealing with some injuries, so I'm going TCU out of the West. I'm going to be stubborn. They have you know they can defend. Very experienced, good coach, NBA guards like guards play in March, and TCU is one of the best. And Mike Miles. Going to the Midwest, I think the Midwest is going to play out fairly chalky. Uh, that's where I'm taking Houston to get through. I think that they they have a, a potential injury to Marcus Sasser. I think he's going to be fine. He hurt his groin. But I don't see anyone that's going to take them. I mean, maybe Indiana, but Indiana has a brutal, brutal pod. I mean, Kent State in the first round could beat them. Drake could beat them in the second round or Miami if they're healthy. So I think we're going to get like Texas, Houston will be a fun elite eight. I'm going to take Houston there to get to the final four. I've gone back and forth. I might end up taking Texas, but for now we'll go Houston, TCU. Got to get stopped with these Texas teams. And then in the South, I think the South will also play out fairly chalky. Can't see anyone giving Alabama game. Maybe San Diego State in the Sweet 16, if they can just slow that game to a halt and get Alabama uncomfortable. But I think Alabama has too much talent. They're going to get the elite eight. And then it's, you know, Arizona, Creighton, I think. Um, Baylor has too many defensive issues. So I think it's going to be chalky there in the South, too, with the one or two seed. I'm going to go Alabama for now. Kirk Creasa, Arizona's guard, very erratic. He's dealing with injury with his shoulder. It's really detrimental to his shooting right now. So let's go Arizona, excuse me, Alabama, Houston, TCU. So we got a one, a one, a six seed. And then the East, that's the other region where I think it's going to be carnage. Take a shot, all these teams that are overseeded. Purdue could easily lose in the second round to Memphis or FAU. I don't know who's going to win that game, though. But if Memphis does, I think they can go to the Final Four. So, yeah, why not go out on the limb? I think it's going to be maybe Marquette, Memphis, but Marquette is a tough first round. So let's go Memphis in the Final Four. Memphis, Alabama, TCU. And Houston, you got a one, a one, a six, and an eight. You know why I'm excited about this? I know significantly less about college basketball than you do. And I was doing my bracket, as as I said, we're going to do a bracket reveal show, me, you, Maria, and uh, Raybon tomorrow. It's Wednesday. Maria and I were reviewing our brackets last night and we ended up in a relatively similar place with the one seeds you suggested and some wild cards coming out of the West and the East. So I'm excited for us to continue talking about that. Cause that's feels like we're ending up in the same place. Yeah. But if you're in a, if, I will say if you're in a smaller pool, like this is my final four and I'm in like really, really big pools, which are hard to win, but you're in a smaller pool an office pool. You probably don't want to take Memphis to go to the final four. They're a two point favorite in the first round. So like the, the FAU is a really good team. It's a shame they got matched up together. But if Memphis goes down on the first day and you're in like a smaller pool, you're, you're done. And you don't want that to happen if you're in a smaller pool. But if you're in a really big pool and you're trying to win it, you got to take some shots and take some chances. 
And, you know, so maybe that's when you do have a Memphis getting to the final four. That's when you take a TCU. Also, a lot of people I think are going to go chalky in those two top regions. So if you're trying to win a bigger pool, maybe you do have Alabama going down to San Diego State. And you root for that. And if Alabama goes down along the way, then you're sitting pretty um, in your bracket. So there's a lot of game theory. And then depending on the size of your pool, especially bigger pools, you want to be a lot riskier and take some chances. Um, but yeah, and Memphis certainly is because they're playing basically a coin flip game in the first round. And you're going to have a lot of trouble winning your bracket if your final four teams out in the, one of the first two days. Simon, do you have a final four set? No, I'm a, I was going to, I was going to listen to these guys before I do anything, because I just, I know I don't know anything. Like I'm, I'm just very. That's ACC. how you win it. That's the people that win it. When you don't know anything. It's true. So it's true. But like last year, you know, you guys really helped me um, big time. So that's why I'm just gonna be patient and, and try to hear everyone's opinions before I make anything done. Cause I, I kind of do what Stucky talked about where I'll do one of my brackets, just not thinking, just do it in a smaller group. But with these, my bigger money ones, I try to take it more serious. So I try to get all the info before I do anything. I, but speaking of brackets, I used to, now I only do one bracket. Like that's what I've done. Uh, now, if I enter a smaller pool, maybe I'll do something different. But I used to, like going back 15 plus years, Chad, when you were at ESPN, the ESPN tournament challenge, where if you won the bracket, and by, by, in 2004, I was in first place. And I had, uh, of like, I don't know, there was hundreds of thousands of people in that. I was in first place in the Elite Eight, going into the Elite Eight, and I had Arizona beating Illinois, and they were up by like 20 with eight to go. And I had Arizona winning it all, Salim Stoudemire, that team. And Illinois had one of the – Luther Head and that – John Williams, that, they had one of the yeah. craziest comebacks that I'll never forget. <laughs> yes. And that that cost me uh, potential of winning it. I don't know how it would have played out. I was going through all the lead, hundreds of people in the leaderboards that are like – but I used to fill out for that. You could fill out up to 10 brackets. So – and then you had to put in like your information to win. I used to put in my my information, my mom's, my dad's, my brothers, my sisters, um, and I would have fifty brackets in that ESPN challenge. And then I would print them all out, and then have them all spread out in front of me all weekend. But now I'm now I'm a one bracket guy. But that was uh, I'll never forget that game. Almost, uh, almost yeah, it was nineteen, almost twenty years, about twenty years ago when Illinois. If you haven't watched that game, go just YouTube it and watch the final 10 minutes. It was horrendous. A horrendous meltdown by Arizona. Great comeback by Illinois. It's a, it's a fucking insane game. I remember exactly <laughs> where I was when I was watching it. Uh, and because I'm from Chicago and always liked Illinois basketball, going back to the early 80s, because remember, I'm older than all of you. Uh, you know, I just like wanted them to do well. I love that team. Um that comeback was insane. Truly, truly insane. Stuck, before we let you go, I've got your final four picks from those final four. Can you give me a national champion? Well, I should be stubborn and say TCU, but they lost They lost Eddie Lampkin, who's really important to them. He left the team recently. Um, so I'm going to go with, as of now, the safest pick, I think, which is Houston. I think that they're the, given their region, and their experience coaching, I think that they are pretty upset proof. Now they're going to lose to the eight seed in the second round. But I think that they have a really easy path to the Elite Eight. And uh, I trust their defense and experience. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go narrative. Houston, but, but uh, I can hear Jim Nats now saying, what would he say? Houston, you have a champion or something, or Houston, um, Houston, you don't have any problems. Yeah, something like that. No, Houston, there are no problems tonight or something. You well, look, that is champion. narrative, by the way, because it, this is Jim Nance's last Final Four, right? And yep. Jim Nance famously went to the University of Houston. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going full-on narrative. Uh, Houston in Houston with a super experienced team that I think has a really favorable path. Um, and I think Marcus Sasser will be healthy. He's important, but he was potentially going to suit up on Sunday. They already had a one seat, so they held him out precautionary. For precautionary reasons, I think he'll play. I think Helen Sampson's one of the best coaches in the country. And this team uh, is very, very good. So, yeah, I'll go I'll go chalky narrative at Houston as my national title winner. All right. 
Uh, last thing before we get out of here, another breaking news. Uh, the, AP, the Bears have signed four more linebackers. The Bears re-signed their top fullback, but also the consider it's college basketball. The AP just released its uh, uh, first team, its All-American team. Uh, Zach Eady from Purdue. Trace Jackson Davis from Indiana University. Um, uh, let's see. Jalen Wilson also made the team. Um, and let's see. Marcus Sasser, as you just mentioned, and Brandon Miller. Uh, those are the five AP All-Americans. We will be seeing them all in the tournament. Multiple players from, uh, I got one player from each of the top four seeds, plus Trace Jackson Davis. Stucky, everyone. Wait, 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 Chad. Before we run, we we might not see Stuck again before this happens. Stucky, what do you want? Lamar or the picks? Uh, The picks. Wow. Wow. Shocker. Yeah. All right, listen. I got to remind everybody also, we've been talking about all this college basketball betting. Uh, The play-in games are tonight. It's Tuesday and tomorrow, Wednesday. So if you're looking to bet the first four games, to start off March Madness, you must, must, must check out our first four betting preview episode from the Action Network podcast. It's over at the Action Network podcast feed. Check it out. Stucky, as I mentioned, the Action Network OG, the host of Big Bets on Campus, college basketball expert. Thanks for coming on the podcast. You'll be around all week on all Action Network programming, whether it's written word, podcasts, video find it all in the app find it in the podcast places you're the best man oh it's good luck in the tournament everyone thanks for having me and uh yeah good luck to your blue team simon and i'll see you in hoboken chad <laughs> uh see you in hoboken stock for simon hunter for matt mitchell i am chad millman this has been the favorites from the volume podcast network download us from apple Podcasts, from spotify wherever you get your podcast rate review subscribe leave us five stars say whatever you want feedback is a gift don't forget Do not forget, subscribe directly to the favorites. You don't do it, you may miss us. Check it out. Subscribe to the favorites. Till next time. Love you.